The new Pinocchio movie by Guillermo del Toro is a masterpiece. The stop motion is incredible, and the songs are pretty good. But what makes this movie notable among the many Pinocchio revivals are the themes and setting for its story, from friendship, fatherhood, grief, and even war. The story of Pinocchio is set in fascist Italy during the rise of Benito Mussolini, who was the dictator of Italy from 1922 until World War II. And the movie references this era very well. But it's not just an aesthetic choice. Fascism plays a central role in the story. For instance, when Pinocchio performs in Count Volpa's circus, he is forced to headline propaganda numbers to the glory of Mussolini and even performs in front of the dictator. This context sets an interesting tone for the movie because Italy's population behaves like puppets under the thumb of Mussolini, whereas Pinocchio, an actual puppet, goes against conventions. Fascism and war influence the story in more ways than one. For example, in the movie, Geppetto's son Carlo died in World War I, and the movie depicts this scene. So Geppetto's grief and Pinocchio's existence are direct consequence of the war. And Pinocchio himself is recruited by a fascist officer to serve in the army. Human relationships are at the heart of this movie, more specifically, the father-son relationship. We see four instances of this. First, there is Geppetto and Carlo. What defines this relationship is Carlo's death and Geppetto's grief. The movie opens with Geppetto upkeeping his son's tombstone. It shows Geppetto's loss. He's sad. His eyes are watery. It's heartbreaking. And then the movie takes us back in time. We see Geppetto's fatherly nature with Carlo. Seeing Geppetto and Carlo interact helps us contextualize Geppetto's loss. Carlo's death is even depicted in the movie, and it has religious undertones, as Carlo dies amidst the bombing of the church. I think grief is very well depicted in this movie. I witnessed a similar situation in my family where a young person died before their parents, and I think the movie is very well uh, representative of the kind of grief that a parent goes through. Carlo's death is heartbreaking. It depicts the terrible consequences of war, and Geppetto's immediate shock is hard to watch. In the aftermath, Geppetto starts a period of grief. Surviving a child is inhuman, nobody truly recovers. And it's in that context that Pinocchio comes to life. On a night fueled with alcohol, Geppetto cuts the tree standing by Carlo's grave and carves a wooden boy. And Pinocchio eventually comes to life thanks to higher powers. The movie doesn't explain this very much, but the spirit tells Sebastian that she'll grant him a wish if he makes Pinocchio a good boy. There's not much to say about Sebastian J. Cricket. He's annoying in this movie and he doesn't really play a central role. When Geppetto wakes up, he meets Pinocchio for the first time, and the shock is real. Pinocchio says, I'm your son, and Geppetto replies, You're not my son, don't come near me. This will define the early stage of their relationship. Pinocchio is obnoxious and chaotic in the most adorable way, so Geppetto is compelled to care for him. Pinocchio is easy to love. He's joyful, open-minded, and funny. But when Pinocchio shows up at church, the village rejects him. If Pinocchio does not seem phased by this reaction, Geppetto, who's more sensitive to the social pressure of the time, worries for the boy. We will continue exploring their evolving relationship throughout this video. Immediately after the church incident, we are introduced to another father and son duo, Candlewick a young boy who'll eventually befriend Pinocchio, and his father Podesta, a government official of the fascist regime. Their relationship serves as a contrast to Geppetto's caring nature. Podesta is macho and controlling. His expectations of Candlewick are narrow and heavily anchored in national pride and the war. 
He says, Look at my boy Candlewick, a model fascist youth, proud and brave, virile like his father. Podesta suggests Pinocchio should go to school because he's too undisciplined, unlike Candlewick. So the next day before school, Geppetto gives Carlo's old book to Pinocchio. He dances with joy and says, I love it, I love it, I love it, before asking, what is it? And it gives Geppetto the opportunity to tell Pinocchio about his grief and Carlo. Pinocchio asks, you loved him very much? Geppetto answers, I did, I do. So Pinocchio tells Geppetto, he'll be just like Carlo. This heartwarming scene also puts pressure on Pinocchio to live up to Carlo's memory. And Carlo and Pinocchio's experiences mirror throughout the movie. On his way to school, we are introduced to the third father and son duo of the movie, Count Volpe, a greedy circus showrunner, and Spatatura, the monkey puppeteer. Volpe is mean and exploits Spazzatura's talent for his own gain. Throughout the movie, we see disturbing patterns of abuse. At the beginning of the movie, Spazzatura does Volpe's bidding. He plays a role in Pinocchio's grooming, for instance. But as time passes, he'll rebel and betray Volpe. These main relationships of the movie show how sons challenge their father's expectations and how fathers react to their son's identity. We will continue exploring these relationships throughout the video. And by the way, if you like the video, just like the video and you can subscribe for more content like this. Interestingly, this take on Pinocchio's story is not excessively centered on Pinocchio's lie-induced nose growth, although it happens on some occasions. It happens for the first time in front of the congregation. When Pinocchio says, I'm a real boy, his nose grows, even if he believes in his heart that he's a real boy. Instead, lies are repeatedly told to Pinocchio, who's gullible. For instance, Count Volpe preys on Pinocchio and tells him he's the chosen one, a promising star for his puppet show. He promises the world and lies to compel Pinocchio to sign an extensive contract. Death is also interesting in this movie as it adds a whole new dimension to Pinocchio's experience. In fact, Pinocchio dies multiple times in the movie. He dies for the first time after being hit by a car and wakes up in a sort of death processing facility run by rabbits complete with a punch card system. But Pinocchio is not really dead. One rabbit even asks, what part of dead don't you understand? He replies, it's boring in here, I hate being dead. So Pinocchio meets with the spirit of death, who's fabulous by the way. She explains how her sister gave Pinocchio life even though he was not supposed to have it. She calls it folly. The spirit tells Pinocchio he's immortal and at first he's thrilled. She adds, it means you will never be a real boy like Carlo. This crushes Pinocchio, who so desperately wants to be like Carlo to please Geppetto. The spirit explains how Pinocchio will die many, many times, but unlike real boys, it will be meaningless because he'll always be sent back to the living world after completing a waiting period, which will increase with every time he dies. When Pinocchio wakes up from death, everyone's shocked. When Geppetto tells Pinocchio they're going home, Count Volpe says he has a contract with Pinocchio. But Podesta interrupts and suggests Pinocchio is the ideal soldier because he cannot be killed. This scene takes place before a bust of Mussolini, by the way. On their way home, Pinocchio is excited by the idea of going to war. He says, it sounds quite fun. But Geppetto says, war is not fun, war is not good, war took Carlo away from me. So Pinocchio says he simply will not go to war. But Geppetto replies, it's the law. 
he has no choice but to go. So Geppetto's desperation is well felt in this scene. He tells Pinocchio that they will send him to a military youth camp. Geppetto is angry and tells Pinocchio, why can't you be more like Carlo? And Pinocchio replies on the brink of tears, because I'm not Carlo, I don't want to be like Carlo. At night, after this exchange, Pinocchio concludes he should return to Count Volpe's circus. This, he says, would help Geppetto with his financial problems and avoid going to war, for now at least. He leaves Geppetto a note in the form of Sebastian the Cricket. He says, tell him that I will send him money and tell him I love him and I won't be a burden anymore. So Pinocchio wants to help Geppetto despite their argument. His love is sincere. When Pinocchio returns to Count Volpa, he's met with excitement. He makes a deal with the showrunner, and they agree that if Pinocchio works in his puppet show, he'll forget the money Geppetto owes him, split profits 50-50, and send his share to Geppetto. And Volpe leaves with Pinocchio in the dead of night. And so begins a game of cat and mouse. The music montage that follows is heartbreaking. On the one hand, Pinocchio works hard believing he's helping Geppetto, all the while being financially exploited by Count Volpe. And meanwhile, Geppetto is following their tracks, trying to rescue Pinocchio. As Geppetto inches closer, Pinocchio tells Count Volpe, don't forget to send my share of the money back home to Papa. Volpe tells Pinocchio he would never forget, but we know he's been lying all along. Pinocchio learns he will perform for Mussolini in person, and Count Volpe overworks him for the occasion. Eventually, Pinocchio is told, through Spazzatura, that Count Volpe is lying and that he hasn't sent a single penny to Geppetto. But Pinocchio refuses to believe it for now. Meanwhile, Geppetto is swallowed by a whale, or a big fish. About halfway through the movie, the father-son relationships evolved. We just saw how Geppetto tries to save Pinocchio from Count Volpe. The movie also shows Podesta sending Kendallwick to the military youth camp. Finally, we see Count Volpe doubling down on his abuse of Spazzatura, he beats him in front of Pinocchio and tells him, I should have let you die. But Pinocchio stands up for him and asks that Count Volpa stop brutalizing Spazzatura. This shows how kind Pinocchio is. After all, Spazzatura was not always nice to him. He also confronts Count Volpe about their deal. He says, what's this I hear about my papa not getting any money? At that moment, Pinocchio understood his own power. As the star of the show, he has some leverage over Count Volpa. But Volpe grows more violent. He tells Pinocchio, you may have no strings, but I control you. So Pinocchio will have no choice but to rebel. Pinocchio is a rebel at heart, and he proves it repeatedly over the course of the movie. First, he stands up to Geppetto as a figure of authority. For instance, when Geppetto tells Podesta that Pinocchio will stay at home, Pinocchio interrupts, I won't be locked up, I'll smash the windows. And his rebellious nature impacts every stage of the storyline. Following his argument with Count Volpe, Pinocchio wants to rebel. With the help of Spazzatura, they plan to humiliate Count Volpe in front of Mussolini. So Pinocchio changes the usual propaganda performance and goes as far as dancing with a poop puppet and changing Mussolini's name for Puzzolini, which loosely translates to Stinky Lini. Naturally, Mussolini asks that Pinocchio be shot. So he wakes up in the death sorting facility again, and he's ecstatic. But the spirit of death reminds Pinocchio that immortality comes with a burden. She says, while you may have eternal life, your friends, your loved ones, 
they do not. Every moment shared with them may be the very last. This movie's approach to death is spiritual and philosophical, unlike its approach to actual religion. Religion is a strong theme of Guillermo del Toro's movie. Many important scenes take place in the village's church. Carlo's death, for one. At the heart of the church is Geppetto's wooden statue of Jesus, and it creates an interesting parallel with Pinocchio. In the Bible, Jesus is brought to life by a higher power, God. Similarly, Pinocchio is also brought to life by a higher power. But when Pinocchio shows up at church, the priest shames Geppetto for carving Pinocchio before finishing restoring the statue of Jesus. And parishioners extend this sentiment. Some are heard saying, shame on you. Later, Pinocchio points out the irony of the situation when he realizes that people worship Geppetto's wooden crucifix but treat him as a monster. He says, Everybody likes him. They were all singing to him. He's made of wood too. Why do they like him and not me? Geppetto says that sometimes people are afraid of things they don't know, but with time, they like Pinocchio for who he is. When Geppetto finally finishes the statue of Jesus, the priest says, At last, our Savior is restored. But instead of praising Geppetto, Podesta reprimands him for Pinocchio's lack of discipline. This scene helps illustrate who's really in charge. Fascists use religion as a tool for power, especially in times of war. So when Pinocchio wakes up from his second death, he's met with a familiar face. Podesta tells Pinocchio, Follow my orders, learn to obey, and you will be the perfect soldier. Pinocchio may be free from Count Volpe, but at what cost? He's now heading to military youth camp with Candlewick. Upon his arrival at the military youth camp, Pinocchio is excited, as usual, and he starts making friends with Candlewick and the other boys. But the fascist ways are counterintuitive for him. During a speech, Podesta rhetorically asks, Anyone here afraid of the enemy? Pinocchio is the only one who raises his hand. Pinocchio and Candlewick have a conversation in bed, and it's clear how Geppetto and Podesta impacted their worldview. Pinocchio says, My papa said war is bad. Candlewick replies, My father says, If you're afraid to die for your country, you're weak. Candlewick says, I'll show my father I'm no coward. I'll make him like me. So it's clear that Candlewick feels pressure from his father and even doubts he's loved. Pinocchio says, You know, all fathers love their sons. They may even call you ugly things like a burden or a coward, but inside, they love you. And Candlewick cries. It's a beautiful moment. Candlewick then asks Pinocchio if he's afraid to die. But Pinocchio is not afraid because he died a couple of times already. He adds, there are rabbits and card games and a lot of sand. Candlewick concludes, you're so weird, and adds, I'm glad you're here. So despite war and fascism, friendship can still bloom. The next day, the boys at the military youth camp are divided into two teams. Candlewick and Pinocchio lead opposite teams. To win the exercise, a team must be the first to hang their flag at the top of the pole. When Pinocchio and Candlewick decide to share the win, Podesta scolds them and puts a gun on the table. He says, Candlewick, shoot the puppet. As tensions rise, they are interrupted by an air raid, and Candlewick refuses to shoot his friend. He says, no, I will not let you do this. He tells his father that he'll never be able to please him. Podesta doubles down and calls him a filthy coward before lifting him off the ground and brutalizing him. You're no son of mine, he says. 
In my House of the Dragon videos, we saw how Alicent uses similar language when she tells Aegon, you're no son of mine. It's a violent thing to tell a child. As Podesta was about to shoot Pinocchio, Candlewick saves him before being hit by the air raid. And that's when Pinocchio encounters Count Volpa again, who ties him to a cross. The religious symbolism is strong in this scene. Pinocchio implores Spazzatura to help him. Count Volpe lights the cross on fire, and Spazzatura finally betrays Volpe and helps free Pinocchio. They fight and both fall down the cliff, but Spazzatura survives. Pinocchio is finally reunited with Geppetto inside the whale. This scene is interesting because it portrays chosen family. Pinocchio, Geppetto, Spazzatura, and Sebastian share dinner, but the lot eventually escape the whale, although Geppetto is still in danger. In the midst of it all, Pinocchio dies again, and he implores the spirit of death to send him back now. He cannot wait because he needs to save Geppetto. So the spirit of death is willing to make a deal. She says, if you were to go back now, so soon, you would become mortal. You might save Geppetto, but you will die, and it will be your last life. And Pinocchio agrees. He's willing to sacrifice his immortality for a chance to save Geppetto. In other words, Pinocchio is a real boy at last. And Pinocchio manages to save Geppetto, but when Geppetto wakes up on the beach, he finds Pinocchio unanimated. He's dead. And it's heartbreaking. I cried watching it for the first time. The sister of the spirit of death visits Geppetto and tells him, To save you, he became a real boy. And real boys don't come back. To see Geppetto grieve another boy is heartbreaking. But Sebastian reminds the spirit that she granted him a wish, and he wishes for Pinocchio to come back to life. So she agrees and brings Pinocchio back to life one last time. Geppetto tells Pinocchio, I was trying to make you someone you were not, so don't be Carlo or anyone else. Be exactly who you are. I love you exactly as you are. And Pinocchio concludes, Then I will be Pinocchio, and you will be my papa. As the movie concludes, Pinocchio's relationship with death continues to grow as he sees Geppetto and Sebastian die of old age one by one. It's a beautiful conclusion to a philosophical movie. I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below.